it's Charlene, isn't it? That's correct. Okay. Charlene, do you want to give us your full name and uh, spell it for us, please, with your maiden name included? Sure. You know, that's the first thing I say to clients when they're on the stand. I feel like I'm on the stand. <laughs> C-H-A-R-L-E-N-E, -E, Charlene Marie, M-A-R-I-E, Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Is that your maiden name? That's my married name. Okay. And what was your... My maiden name was Ratch, R-A-T-S-C-H. My father was German. This don't work, so you got to give me a little higher. He was what? German. Okay, okay. Now, give me uh, your date of birth and location where you were born. I was born October 28th, 1943 at Misericordia Hospia, Hospital in Milwaukee. Okay. And what were the names of your parents with your mother's maiden name? Uh, my mother's maiden name was Arlene Mead, M-E-A-D-E. And my father's name was uh, Charles Ratch, R-A-T-S-C-H. Okay. Do you remember your grandparents at all? Yes, very well. I'm the oldest of the oldest, so. Because you what? I'm the oldest child of the oldest child, so I was first. I remember the grandparents very well. Okay. Can you give us their names? Well, my, father's, my father was white, and his dad was Albert Ratch. His parents came from Germany. My grandmother uh, was Marie Petrus, and her parents came from Bohemia. Um, on my mother's side, my grandma's maiden name was Alice Paulus, and my grandfather's name was um, George Mead, Lester Mead. Now, is that? Lester George Mead, I'm sorry. And he was English. And he was, he, and he was the great-great-grandson of General George Meade in the Civil War. Okay, let's talk about uh, your father's side. Mm -hmm. His father and his mother. What was, uh, what, what kind of a makeup was, was, uh, was your uh, grandfather? Uh, uh, oh, he was a wonderful man. He graduated from third grade and he had to drop out of school. And when he died in his early 50s, he was the vice president of Chain Belt Corporation, one of the largest industrial factories in Milwaukee. You can't do that today. Taught himself how to play musical instruments. He was an artist. He was a boxer. He was a streetcar conductor. I mean, a detective. He was just one of a kind man. Was he a big fellow? Little guy. Little guy. Mm -hmm. And he used to work with Indians. Uh, pick potatoes in the middle part of Wisconsin somewhere. He loved Indian people. So he was first generation? Yes. His father, no, his father came from uh, Germany, and he was first generation here. Okay. Did he speak the language? Oh, yeah. Uh, interspersed a lot of German here and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of, uh, you said he had a third grade education. Mm -hmm. He had to. How did, he, how did he get into the position that you were talking about as the vice president? Well, he started uh, as an office manager uh, and just worked his way up. You can't really do that today without a college degree, but in those days you could. And just worked his way up? Just by using his wits and his experiences. And what, what years were those, would those be about? Well, he died in 1948, so it would have been in the late 30s, early 40s. Okay. Those are tough years. Yeah. Lived mm -hmm. through the Depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, that's, your, 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 that's your grandfather now. Father's father. And then father. You, your father's father. father. Okay. And uh, your father's mother now. Marie, um, my grandmother, was a tall, stately, bohemian woman who was extremely nice. Uh, people said she was an angel walking on earth. She was a, a typical housewife. She cooked and cleaned and she was always up first in the morning and last to go to bed at night. Her kitchen always smelled of Kringle or cooking and it, uh, it was a pleasure to be there with her. She taught me many things. And how many, how many brothers and sisters did your father have? One sister. One sister. One sister? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's still alive. They're both alive. Mm -hmm. My father's yeah. 95 and his sister, I mean, 85 and his sister is 89. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what, what part of Milwaukee 
did they live in? Oh, uh, the West Dallas, South Milwaukee side. Okay. All right. Did um, I'm trying to figure out where the Indian part comes in? My mother's side. On your mother's side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay, that's pretty much. And your mother was from where again? Well, she was born right here in Oneida. No, in Oneida. Yes. I mean, I'm I'm sorry, your grandmother. On your father's side, where is she from? From Milwaukee. She was born in Milwaukee in the 1800s. And what nationality was she? Bohemian. Bohemian. It was a time when Bohemia was part of Germany. She called herself German. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Because, well, Milwaukee is a pretty heavy populated German town anyway. It is, yeah. yeah. Got good meat on it. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's, let's go to your... your uh, your mother's side now. Okay. Um, okay, you, your father. I mean, her father. His name, and tell me something about him. Okay, my mother's father's name was Lester George Meade. He was the great great grandson of George, General George Meade, who fought in the Civil War. He was an electrician by trade and has his own business. He was a tall, stately Englishman type. Uh, he, he was born in this country, though. And. Um, uh, I, I didn't see a whole lot out of him because he was always working. I didn't have a whole lot of contact with him. What kind of work did he do? He uh, had his own electrical business. In Milwaukee? Yes. Okay. And how does that name, is that, you spell that name again? M-E-A-D-E. -E. Oh, oh, Mead. Yes. Okay. And do you know what kind of uh, education he had? No, I don't. Okay. No idea. And what was he born in this country? Yes, yes. And from English, English Irish parents. Okay. Was he first, second generation? Do you know? I believe the first generation. No, first. no, no. He couldn't have been because his great grandfather was General George Meade. So he was no. I don't know. Couple maybe generations. Third, yeah, of third, fourth Moldova. generation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, your mother. Now. Okay. She was. What was her maiden name again? Arlene Mead. Her maiden name? Mead. Reed? Mead. M E A D E. I thought she was the United Connection. Well, my grandmother was Alice Paulus. Okay, that's. Okay, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm losing it here. <laughs> um, that's the part I'm looking for, your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was Alice Paulus? Alice Paulus. Okay. And her father was William Paulus, who at one time owned all this land and had donated it to the uh, Holy Apostles Church, the land where the, uh, that building across the street. Parish Hall. Parish Hall, and mm -hmm. all that, yeah, and all this land off to the left here. I see. Yeah. That was his allotment then? Yeah, yes, okay. yes. And um, where did, uh, did you know what educational background your grandmother had? Um, I believe she graduated from high school. I know she went to Carlisle University for a short period of time. She told me that uh, she was working in the kitchen at Carlisle when Jim Thorpe was there. And she had actually at one point passed a note between Jim and his girlfriend to the next table. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she was only there for a year. So that must have been right around the uh, turn of the century then, about 1910. 1905, somewhere there? Uh, Maybe a little later than that, but not much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, about how old was she when she went away to school, did she ever say? No, she didn't tell me. Did she? But she did say she had been in boarding schools. She what? She had been in boarding schools. Boarding school? Yeah, and she, she was, uh, she, I remember her telling me that, I asked her why she never spoke Oneida to us, and she said it's because we were, we were made ashamed of our language. Um, she grew up, she was born here in Oneida, and she grew up here. And uh, when she um, was a young woman, she started cleaning for a living. And she went into Green Bay to find jobs, but there was so much prejudice against Indians that she couldn't find work. So she went to uh, Milwaukee and found cleaning jobs in Milwaukee. And there she met and married my grandfather, who was a white man. So the Indian uh, prejudice in Green Bay helped to thin the blood in that way. Okay. 
And when when she came back, uh, what? And then she went down to Milwaukee. So she came back from Carlisle, uh-huh. and then she went down to Milwaukee, uh-huh. and she met your grandfather. Uh-huh. Um, how many children did they have? My grandmother had seven children. My mother's the oldest. And do you, can you give us the names? Oh, yeah. My mother was Arlene. Um, the next one down was um, Margaret. Then uh, was Shirley. Arlene, Margaret, Shirley, Dorothy, Buddy. She had one son. Marianne and Carol. Oh, that's a good-sized family. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And um, your uh, your mother did she work out of the home or did she pretty much do be own my own mother housewife? I mean your your grandmother my grandmother sure. she worked as a cleaning lady uh, her and my grandfather divorced um, and uh, she still stayed on as a cleaning lady in Milwaukee okay and and her and her children would live together as is the Oneida custom. She'd live with one daughter, and then she'd live with another daughter and another daughter. Mm-hmm. She lived with us for the last ten years of her life. I see. And where did uh, where did your grandmother and your grandfather reside? In West Dallas. West Dallas. Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about your uh, uh, your father. My mother. Uh, your your mother's, yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> uh, your mother. Let's, let's, uh, she went down. My mother was the, born here yeah. in Oneida, right across the street, as a matter of fact, in Russell Matoxin's house. She was born in 1933, January 1st, in the middle of a blizzard. She was delivered by Dr. Monica Hill. And because it was January 1st, her nickname was Huayan for a few years. Oh, that right? <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then my grandmother took her back down to Milwaukee. I see. She came up here just to give birth. Now, did uh, did your parents have uh, a connection uh, with Oneida? You know, uh, oh. pretty close, or did they just come up? You know, frequent or infrequently? We came up a lot. Yeah. Uh, my mother was very close with her. Her first cousin, uh, Russell. Matoxin and Roy and Ronnie and she had quite a few cousins up here and aunts and uncles and we would stay by Uncle Alfian and Aunt Virgie's. Uh, we'd come up at least twice a year and in the summer we'd stay for two or three weeks or go by Aunt Virgie, uh, Aunt Mercy and Uncle Eli and they lived on South Park Road, South Park Avenue. Mm-hmm. And uh, they lived in one of those old uh, log homes that had siding on it. And um, uh, yeah, and then we'd go up to the school across the street here and swing on the swings of the merry-go-round. Yeah, and it was all—all all the streets were um, gravel. There were no paved roads in those days. That would be in the late forties. Okay, well, the hospital was still up then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was a Catholic school up on Service Road there too. The nuns and a couple of my aunts that did attend that school. Okay. Now there was, uh, you say there was how many of you in in your family? I'm the oldest of five. Five. Mm-hmm. And uh, did you live r- in a rural area in West Dallas, or uh, was it pretty much city? Actually, my grandparents lived in West Dallas. My mother and stepfather, because she remarried, uh, lived on the south side of Milwaukee. At the time, it was a, basically a Polish-American neighborhood. We were the only Indians around. Hmm. Uh, did you have an opportunity to have any kind of a, a farm or when uh, I got garden? to be when I got to be twelve years old, we moved out to the Holy Hill area, and then we had a big garden and everything. Yeah. How much property did you did you have at Holy Hill? About three and a half acres. Okay, that's pretty wide open country at that time. At that time, it was very <laughs> desolate. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it isn't now. Yeah, and what were your responsibilities at home as a child? Being the oldest, I had to babysit for my uh, brother and sister's dishes every day, cleaning, vacuuming, and not vacuuming, we had a carpet sweeper, things like that. And then when we first moved out to Holy Hill, we didn't have a well, so we had a windmill, 
And then we'd have to go out, especially in winter, it was hard because you had to go out with a bucket of water and you had to prime the pump and then to bring the water in and boil it for, for bathing and clothes. You never stuck your tongue on the pump handle, did no, you? I, no, I knew better than that. <laughs> and we had two outhouses. We were rich. We had two of them. <laughs> no waiting. <laughs> um, how, how far away was your school that you started? It uh, took about an hour. Hour? Yeah. Well, your bus, bus I imagine. Yeah, bus, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the name of the school? It was Hartford High School. The grade school was Platt. It was a one-room grade school. That was only a, a mile down the road, and I had to walk it uphill both ways. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I assume that you were probably the only Indian yeah. in, in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of um, what kind of information did your uh, did your family instill in you about being on night at you know at a young age, well, or did they at all? Yeah, very much so. Actually, uh, we had a even though we lived in Milwaukee and not on the res, my my aunts always came to live with us, our cousins. Uh, one time, a cousin uh, Virginia. Thornton and her mother, Alma Thornton, who just recently passed away, um, uh, Alma was going to uh, teacher's college and she needed somebody to watch her, her two daughters, Rita and Virginia, and my mother said, well, bring them here. So they stayed with us for a while while her mom finished school. Uh, and my aunts and my grandparents and my grandmother, who was a widow at the time, then she lived with us. I mean, I'd come down to breakfast in the morning and I wouldn't know who'd be sitting at the table. <laughs> my mom had open arms for everyone. And that was very Oneida traditional. Yeah. Did did your parents or your mother primarily, I suppose, uh, you know, have any discussions where you were able to, you know, sit around and listen to mm -hmm. uh, about Oneida and Oneida uh, life here in the reservation or the government or anything like that? Well, they would talk about the boarding school that my grandmother went to because my grandmother told them too. Um, we, we were a very Oneida-oriented family. Uh, we always said schooly when we saw each other and um, uh, was staciously in the morning. And my mom made uh, corn soup and fry bread a lot. So um, uh, it was very in, we're very Oneida-oriented family, jigged, always jigging <laughs> in a circle, the girls. <laughs> How did, uh, did they ever talk about or did you ever receive uh, these checks they used to get for 52 cents? I don't recall that, no. Huh? No. Did they ever talk about the New York claim? No. No? Uh -uh. Okay. And what about, uh, tell me what a typical weekend, a Sunday, Sunday would be like. As a little kid living in Milwaukee or as a bigger kid living near Holy Hill? Well. They're different. Okay, tell me. Tell me one from the other then. Well, when I was a little kid, I was like, very, very religious. And I I would walk to church myself <laughs> because my parents would be sleeping in. But I walked to church every Sunday. Sunday. Um, and then we'd sit around the house and there wasn't much on TV. There was three stations, black and white, usually came on at around 1 o'clock in the afternoon and went off at, I think, 10 o'clock at night, off the air. And there was always some kind of a theater program on Saturday night. My dad would buy one bottle of root beer soda and one pint of ice cream. And we all had root beer floats and that was our treat for the week. And we just couldn't wait for Saturday night. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what church did you attend at the time? Uh, St. Paul's Lutheran. Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what uh, your mother was or was that what your father was? Actually my mother and father were both Catholic. My mother was baptized in this church, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, my mother remarried, and she wasn't particularly religious, I don't believe, whereas my stepfather was, and he was Lutheran, so we were all brought up Lutheran. Okay. Now, you tell me it changed as you got a little older, mm -hmm. and tell me the change. Well, when we lived in the country, there were a lot more chores to do on weekends. In the summer, it was weeding the garden, mowing the grass. Uh, we had free time. There's a lot of woods that we could go into and explore, and I loved to climb trees. I was very much of a tomboy, and 
um, go down to the creek, things like that. Now, uh, you were the oldest, mm -hmm. so uh, when you started school, uh, what was the name of that again? You mean when I first started school? Like we, you said there was a, uh, one room or was it two rooms? Oh, well, when I first went to school, it was Walter Ellen Grade School in Milwaukee. That's, no, that's not there anymore. Okay. Then we moved off to the country for seventh and eighth grade. I went to Platt School. Okay. That was a one room, two room, one to two room school. Uh, and then I went to Hartford High School. After Hartford High School, then I got married. And about what year was that? 1960. 1960? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, what, uh, what was your husband's name? Um, which one? <laughs> well, let's, let's, I don't know how many there are, but. Let's start with the one in 1960. <laughs> James Prewe. Uh, James Prewe, P-R-I-E-W-E. -E. I had four children with him. And where was he from? Milwaukee. Milwaukee? Okay. And uh, why don't you give us the names of those four children? Uh, my oldest boy is Jonathan James. And my second boy is Joseph James. My daughter is Ellen Marie. And my youngest is Richard James. And how old is your oldest? I think he's 41. 41? Mm -hmm. Okay. And are, do they all reside down in the Milwaukee area? Oh, no, they're all over. My oldest boy lives in um, Crystal Falls, Mich Michigan. And what does he do? He's a technician. My next son, Joseph, lives in, uh, on Pine Lake outside Waukesha, and he's a painter. My daughter lives in Shawano. She's a high school English teacher. And my youngest son, Richard, lives here in Green Bay, and he's on Social Security Disability. Okay. Now, do we have any grandchildren from those four? Oh, you're getting deep into it. Yeah, seven of them. Okay, tell us about what their <laughs> names are, if you can. Okay. My eldest boy adopted one girl. Her name is Diana. Uh, she's a Filipino, a very beautiful girl. Uh, my oldest natural a bio, a biological grandchild is um, Jim, and he's uh, 21. Then I have Lisa, 21. She's here in Green Bay. She's a tattoo artist. <laughs> and uh, then I have Samantha, 17. She's here in Green Bay. Um, and then I have uh, Joseph, Liz and Shano, Mariah, and she's 12, and she lives in Pine Lake. Um, I believe that's all. Last count. <laughs> Any great-grandchildren from that? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet, no. Well, there's still time. Yeah, they're old enough. Okay. <laughs> now, this is, from, this is from your first 1960 yes. situation. Yes. Okay. Did you work out of the home then, or did you stay home and, and take care of the kids? I was mostly a housewife and mother. Housewife, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did you say your husband did at the time? He was a factory worker. A what? A factory worker. Oh, okay. Turret lathe operator. Okay. Yeah. And you, you all resided down around Milwaukee? In Milwaukee for a while, then we moved to New Berlin. Okay. All right. Um, once you're... Kids, you know, got of age and were going to school. Did you uh, continue staying home, or did you go back to work, or what? Well, what my husband then? and I divorced, and um, I went back to school and I got an LPN. That's a one-year nursing degree at a Catholic school in Milwaukee. And I worked in a nursing home for about five years. Then I went back to school and got my two-year RN degree at Waukesha Technical Institute. Then I went back to school and got my Bachelor of Science degree in nursing at Alverno College. Then I went back to school and got my law degree from Marquette University Law School. Well, did you practice uh, your, your nursing work? Uh? I was a nurse, uh, nurse manager and nursing supervisor for 17 years. 17 years? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Now, I assume if you made, you said the, uh, which one, 
You must have got <laughs> married again. I, I, yes, I, my present husband is my fourth husband. <laughs> well, do you want to share the uh, second and third, or should we just go to the fourth one? Uh, forget the second and third. Okay, <laughs> I did. Okay. Do you have any? Do you have any additional children besides the four? No, that's all. Okay. That's enough. Okay, you stop there. Yeah. All right. Plenty. And you're presently married to David Smith, full blood Oneida man, happily Who? married. David Smith. David Smith. Yeah. Where and full blooded what? Oneida. Oh, is he from here? Yeah, he's right from here. Oh, yeah. Grew up in Site One. <laughs> it's not the same David I know, is it? Tall, lanky. Good looking. Incredibly handsome. Yeah. Ah, that's the one. Sexy. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> How did you happen to meet him? Uh, my husband at the time, I was living up here, and I were separating, and I wanted my house painted. I asked somebody for the name of a good Oneida painter, and they gave me his name. And uh, my, then my husband and I separated. He moved to Colorado. And I was in the house alone, and I looked out the window, and there was David on a ladder painting my house in the summer, wearing shorts. And I saw those gorgeous brown Oneida legs. I said, I'm going to marry that man. And I did. <laughs> That's incredible. I'm glad he had his shorts on. I could say something. And, <laughs> <laughs> and what year was that? Uh, we were married four years ago, so it'd be 19, uh, 1999. Oh, yeah. you're still a newlywed. Oh, yeah. The blushed red color is coming across the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, This is going to show up nice on that blue. Oh. <laughs> yeah, if I would have known no night of men were such good guys, I would have. What, what brought you back up, uh, you know, from Milwaukee, if, first of all? Well, when I graduated from law school, I opened up my own law office in Milwaukee. And I was right on Wisconsin Avenue, which was really convenient to the courthouse. Uh, I put an ad in the Golly Sox because I wanted more business, more clients. Lloyd Paulus, who was the division director at the time of the compliance division, saw my ad, uh, asked me if I would come up and work for him as the um, supervisor for the paralegals and uh, closed down my business and came right up and I haven't been sorry, haven't missed Milwaukee one day since. And, love it, and, love and it here. How long were you in uh, private practice? About four years. Four years. Yeah. What prompted you to leave the, uh, uh, the nursing world and go into the, you know, the, well, what you are now? Well, when my mother uh, was younger, from time to time she'd take a job as a nurse's aide. And she always wanted me to be a nurse. so I pretty much fulfilled that. Uh, as a little kid, I, one time I even wrote a, uh, an essay that, what did you want to be when you grow up? And it was to be a lawyer. So I kind of always wanted to do that. So when my kids were almost grown, I thought, now's the time to fulfill my dream. And I, I did, and I didn't think I'd make it, but I did. I got a scholarship for the first year and a half, and the tribe helped me out for the second year and a half, and worked out good. What do you think is the most interesting situations you were in when you were uh, you're practicing, you know, private practice? Oh, there's a hundred stories I could tell. I, Just give us a couple. Oh, private practice. Oh, I wish I would have known you were going to ask that question. I would have thought about it. Well. Yeah, but I want a spontaneous reaction. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one day I was running to court in Waukesha, because I sometimes went to court in Milwaukee and sometimes to court in Waukesha. I was on the public defender's list, so I would get the overflow for the criminal defense people. And um, I had to run to Waukesha, and then I had to quick come back to Milwaukee for another case. Well, while I was running to the courthouse, I slipped and fell and broke my ankle in the hall. And as I was looking up on the floor, here's all these lawyers walking past me. <laughs> Nobody stopped to help me. <laughs> So I finally got up, went into the courthouse, limping, and the judge took pity on me and called my case first. And here I was defending a prostitute that never showed up. <laughs> so I went from there to the hospital and got my cast put on. She probably had too many clients. <laughs> <laughs> Give me another one. Uh, one time I was given the case of a man who had no address. But he did manage to get to a payphone and call me and told me a sad story on the phone. Um, he was convicted of an attempted murder. It was reduced to, to battery, though. 
So I, I tried to get a hold of them. I couldn't get a hold of them. couldn't get a hold of them. Finally, the court date came up, and I, I thought he wasn't going to show, and in those cases, the judges just put a warrant out for your arrest. I figured that's what was going to happen, because I think he told me he was a street person living in Milwaukee on the street. And it was about fall. It was just starting to get cold. So I get to the courthouse that day, and sure enough, there he shows up. He's in the hall. He looks like a little Willie Nelson with the long, scraggly beard and his black socks and, and his white, torn tennis shoes, although they weren't black socks. He had no socks on. <laughs> he was just dirty. And <laughs> I didn't know anything about his case at all. And I says, you know, I, I really can't go forward with this. Oh, I want to get this over with. I want to get it over with today. And I said, why? He says, because I want to go to jail. <laughs> He says, why? I said, because it's winter time. He said, I, I need a warm place to sleep and some good food. He wanted to go to jail. So he got in front of the judge, and he was telling his story, and I didn't know anything about it. I was just totally unprepared. I even told the judge, Your Honor, I, I, I'm un unprepared to defend this man. And the judge says, are you ready? He says, I want to get sentenced today, judge. The judge says, okay, tell me your story. He says, well, we were all playing cards, you know, and she, this woman, she was hassling. You know how women get judged. So I took the telephone cord and I wrapped it around her neck and shut her up. <laughs> he said, it didn't really hurt her much, but she called the police. He said, you know how women are, judge. <laughs> and I felt totally helpless sitting next to him. <laughs> oh. What was your specialty then in... in uh you know, in, in the, did you have a particular type of cases that you would look for? Well, I uh, um, so I was starting out. I was new, and I know it takes five years for a business to get off the ground. And actually, after four years, I was doing a pretty good business. Uh, I was doing everything. The public defender work paid about thirty to thirty-five thousand a year, so that was paying my bills. The rest of it, with the gravy, would be the personal injury cases, uh, divorces. I did, did a little of almost everything, so I would become familiar with it all. This mm -hmm. is my training ground, until I discovered what I liked. It turns out what I was best at was uh, criminal defense and arguing cases in court. And I figure, where else can a woman go to argue, get paid for arguing against men, and win? <laughs> Wow, I'm up against some tough, <laughs> tough situations here. <laughs> so after you've seen this guy with the brown legs, David, and uh, was it gold, golden legs? What oh. did you say? Gorgeous. Okay. Uh, you answered the ad from Lloyd. What did he tell you? He wanted me to come up and uh, be the paralegal supervisor because under the, the state law, anyway, paralegals have to be uh, supervised by an attorney or whoever they are working for. In this case, the tribe could get sued for any misadvice they give. And that was in, you say, 94? 95. 95. Uh, and what has the results been so far? Wonderful. Uh, I work very well with the uh, paralegals, and we've expanded the department from just helping out. Uh, we started out by just defending those employees that were unjustly disciplined. And now we've expanded. In fact, we don't call it the paralegal department anymore. We've recently changed the name to the Legal Resource Center. We're available to any tribal member who needs help with a legal issue. We might not be able to represent them, but we'll find the answers for them. We'll tell them the procedures. We could do a referral for a, um, a lawyer in the area. And if it's something that comes before our tribal courts, our tribal jurisdiction, we will represent them. We turn nobody away. Where does a person become knowledgeable of the type of uh, resources that you provide? Uh, pretty much it's word of mouth because our office is so small. We only have two paralegals. And we thought if we would advertise, there'd be people lined up all the way down Highway 54 to come into our office. So, what we, <laughs> But we just recently, um, as, as a matter of fact, it was two weeks ago, we changed the name. We changed our standard operating procedures. Uh, we, we developed a new mission and vision statement. And we're hoping to get one more paralegal in. And then we're going to put an article in the Golly We Sex, and that's how we're going to tell everyone. Okay. I wasn't aware that that's you know was part of the compliance mm -hmm. uh, department. Yeah. And now I'm the interim compliance division director, 
and for today only, <laughs> one day only, <laughs> I'm the general manager of the tribe because Lloyd's out of town mm -hmm. and loving it. <laughs> well, no wonder you could break away and come over here. <laughs> What what is your take on the um, on the casino uh, coming into the community? I mean, even though you, maybe you weren't raised here, mm -hmm. you were up here, and maybe it, you have better insight on it by not being raised here. You know, to come up periodically and see these things within the tribal operations and how they ran, and you know, uh, to make an observance of that. What is your take? on the, the casino and its effect on tribal membership, people, etc. Well, having the advantage of coming from the white and the Indian world, um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the tribe. I'm glad they, they, they took it. Um, I used to joke that it's about time the uh, Indian got money from the white man instead of the other way around, but other than that, it's, uh, um, you know, nobody twists anybody's arm to gamble. People come willingly. If they don't come here, they'll go to Las Vegas or somewhere else to gamble or they'll play cards. Uh, so uh, it, it's a service. People like to gamble and uh, the tribe has become more sovereign, more independent. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And I don't know if everybody knows how much good that it does for our people to have that resource, that revenue coming in to uh, help our elders, for our health care, for our kids, for our educational grants. It's just uh, wonderful. It doesn't just go into our pockets. It goes for the use of the, the whole, the Oneida people. Um, I was just looking it up. Um, the word tribe means um, a family affiliation, uh, a people who are affiliated by blood. The word people tends to mean a, a race, a race of people but a tribe, which is what we are. It, uh, it depicts a certain culture, uh, a culture that is, is similar among all the people of the nation. And that's why I truly believe that we should be called the Oneida Nation, not the Oneida Tribe of Indians of Wisconsin, the Oneida Nation. You don't hear it called France of Europe or China of Asia or Egypt of Africa. We shouldn't be with Oneida of Wisconsin. We should be the Oneida Nation. There's my speech for today. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, uh, that's the way they perceive themselves in New York. They call themselves the Oneida Nation. And they make reference to the area as uh, Oneida Territory Absolutely. as opposed to of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's just another observation, too. Um, what is your uh, opinion on uh, the per capita payment? I think it's a good thing, especially for the elders, especially now that I'm an elder. <laughs> uh, with the elders, particularly those that live on a fixed income, it really helps. Uh, it comes in the fall of the year. It will help for Christmas giving. Otherwise, some of these poor folks, have, they can't even buy their grandchildren gifts. You know, you're living on a fixed income. You barely get by. This helps with that. Uh, people who live on fee land can pay their property taxes. It helps with that. Um, I, th I think it's good. I, I don't think it's too much. I think it shows appreciation toward our people. And it, it shows a sharing of the profits, you know, not an oversharing. I think too much would be a bad thing. It would cause people to not want to uh, go to school and educate themselves and, and better their lives. It's just a little reminder every year because we all belong together and this is our gift from us to us. Now you, you just made reference to the um, type of things that the casino has participated in in the continuing development of the tribe. Mm -hmm. But not a lot of people know about that. From your opinion, what would you see, or how would you take the ball from one step of this end of the court to the other end in terms of getting that out to the United people themselves? What would you, what would you envision doing? Um, well, I think 
personally, I think the Oneida people do know that there are all these services available to them, and it is, it is a result of the revenue generated from the casino. I'm sure they know that. I think the Galiwisaks is a wonderful way to, uh, to get the news out, to get notice to the people. We have our community meetings, which are, are, are adequate. Uh, we have a problem with people uh, being a little apathetic and not wanting to go to all of the meetings. I don't know. I don't have an answer as to how to make people come to a meeting. I don't think you can do that. Um, even in the United States government, you have trouble getting people out to vote. You have, pe have trouble getting people to attend community meetings. Um, and, uh, it, so, and, and usually with the federal government, the way we get our notice as an average citizen is through the, the newspaper or television or radio. And uh, through the tribe, uh, we already have a newspaper. Perhaps the newspaper could be uh, you know, a little more in depth, but other than that, I, I you know, we, our, our nation isn't as, as huge as the United States, so we don't need that big of a uh, of a newspaper, or we don't need national news or anything like that. But I think uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting that out. You just recently went to a meeting, I'm assuming, with the BC? Yes. On, was that on the land claims? Or was that, that was, was on the agenda today? Uh, it was a regular BC meeting for today. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I know that there was, uh, our Linda was supposed to come out today. Oh, was she? And uh, have a discussion on the land claims. But I guess what I'd like to hear your observation uh, looking at the land claims, what did... What did what, what's your take on that? You obviously have an opinion on that, oh, sure being a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I have a take on it being an Oneida. <laughs> uh, let me try to think here. What would my take be? I think we need, uh, we need that footprint, definitely. We need to have our presence known. Um, we were removed from New York and brought to Wisconsin under a fraudulent, on a fraudulent basis, saying there was going to be a, an Iroquois um, kingdom, something. Empire. Iroquois empire it was going to be. So we went. Um, at least the bravest of us went. The other one stayed behind. That's why the bravest are here in Oneida. <laughs> That's my theory. <laughs> And, uh, but we were, we were removed fraud, uh, under fraud, uh, false pretenses. I do believe that we, we should be entitled to some of the land. Um, I don't think we should be entitled to a lot of it because we haven't been there in so long. But, and I think most of us are very happy here. Most of us can't remember our ancestors living there. Uh, I think we do need a footprint, though. I went back there. When my husband and I got married. We went to Oneida, New York on our, on our honeymoon. And the uh, landscape uh, is sim very similar to here. It looks very much like here. I noticed a lot more prejudice against Indians in the surrounding areas. My husband and I would walk into a, uh, into a gas station or a, uh, into a restaurant. We'd get served last. People would look at us because I look white. He looks very Indian. Look at us strangely. You could tell the look. And I don't see that here. But it, it's definitely there in New York. So I don't think I'd want to move back there. And I don't know many Oneidas from here that would want to move back there anyway. Mm -hmm. But I do I think we're entitled to some compensation for the loss of the land. What is your, uh, what is your per position uh, or uh, explanation or comments? I guess you, I don't know what uh, I'm trying to say, but Give me some feedback on tribal sovereignty. I think sovereignty is probably the most number one important issue of all, and that we have it and we cannot let it go. And sovereignty is, is a living thing. It has to be used. It has to be exercised. It has to be known and made known. And if you don't do those things, you'll lose it. Uh, I think our sovereignty is what keeps us together as a people. It's what recognizes us as a nation. 
And if we don't have sovereignty, we don't have anything. Uh, and I think it starts with the courts. I would like to see us have uh, a full court with, um, uh, with uh, retrocession. I think we need retrocession from the state so that we can hear criminal cases. I have taken some cases to Brown County Court criminal trial, and uh, an individual is supposed to be uh, tried by a jury of their peers. Uh, the individual I had was very dark colored skin and long black hair and a ponytail, and the jury were all 12 white people. Now, you tell me if that's a jury of your peers or not. <laughs> Didn't have a chance. So what we need is a court with a jury system here where they can be tried by a jury of their peers. And what's it take to, uh, to accomplish that? Well, um, it's called retrocession. Um, we, are, we are a PL-280 state, so that means that there are a few of us states, California I believe is one, and I forgot the other states, where we do not have criminal jurisdiction. It was given to the state. Uh, in order to get that back, first of all, the state has to agree to give it back to us, uh, and then we have to file in federal court to get it. And it's, uh, um, it's a lot of paperwork, and I don't know why it hasn't been done, but uh, it hasn't been done yet. What, what kind of recommendations do you do you or would you like to share with the youth? With the youth? Mm -hmm. uh, well, as I was driving here today, I came past some, some road workers and they were um, putting down tar. They were hot. They were dirty. They were sweaty. They were probably getting $15 an hour and they probably don't have an education. I have an education. I get considerably more money than that. I don't get dirty. I don't get hot. I don't get sweaty. Now, if you want a hot, dirty, sweaty, low-paying job, drop out of school. If you want a good job, something you can enjoy, something that pays well, something that isn't too hard on the old bones, go to school and keep going to school and don't stop. Okay. Is there any areas I neglected to cover? Women's lib, I know I didn't get into that, but uh, I, I don't. I don't need women's lib. <laughs> I am my own women's lib. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I'm trying to think. You said you were driving over here. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me share one little bit of wisdom. I told you my grandmother, maiden name was Alice Polish, and she lived with us for 10 years. And when I was a child, I was a very precocious child, and I talked a lot. You'd never believe that by listening to me now, but I talked a lot and asked a lot of questions, and she would get tired of me, and more than once I heard her tell me, Charlene, the emptiest drum makes the loudest noise. <laughs> so I knew it was time to leave Grandma alone. <laughs> well, I uh, really appreciate you taking time out and even though you are the general manager and uh, One day. the big hot show today <laughs> uh, and coming down and sharing this time with us. And, okay, you're welcome. And, it, was, uh, it was fun. I, I always love talking about myself. I think everybody does. <laughs> well, Alan's going to unhitch you. Okay. And, uh, oh. See the... Okay. Who are we looking at in this photo? That's Alice Paulus, my grandmother. She was born and raised here in Oneida. Her father was William Paulus, and he owned the land that the parish hall is sitting on now and the home where Russell Metaxon lives, which is right across the street from the church uh, cemetery. Do you have any particular memories of your grandmother? Alice. She liked to laugh. She was little, um, very pretty. Um, she was uh, a very sweet, very happy, very happy woman, despite all the hardships she had. Okay. Okay, tell us about this photo. That is my mother. Uh, she was Arlene Mead, and that's me. That probably was taken in 1945 or 46. Okay. 
So you would be about how old in this picture? Three, four, okay. something like that, yeah. Okay. Okay. That's my mother's brother, my uncle Bud Mead. He was Lester Mead Jr. They called him Buddy. He served in World War II in the, um, I believe it was the Philippine Islands. I know it was in islands near Japan. Uh, he never talked about it much. I know he saw a lot of action. One story he told me is that he jumped into a foxhole one night and they were shooting and there was grenades going and bombs blasting. He couldn't hear anything. Another guy jumped in the foxhole and they held guns on each other all night long. And then when the daylight came, they could see each other. And they were both Americans, and their names were both Lester and Mead. The other one was from California. And it, it got into the papers, yeah. <laughs> okay. That is my mother on the left and my Aunt Virgie Paulus. That was taken behind her house. The house is right down the road here across the street from the cemetery. In that house was where my mother was born. Russell Matoxon lives there today. Uh, Virgie and her husband, Alfian, who was my grandmother's brother, never had children. So when they died, they gave the house to Russell Matoxon. Uh, I believe that's the original house where William Paulus lived before he gave a lot of the land to the, uh, to the Holy Apostles' Church. Okay. That's my mother in the middle with my Aunt Mercy and Uncle Eli were, uh, in their front yard of their home on Salt Pork Avenue. They lived in one of those log homes that was covered with, uh, it had some kind of a, a tile on the outside. I believe those houses are no longer there. Okay. That's my Uncle Eli, I mean, Alfian, I'm sorry, on the left, Alfian Paulus and his farmhand, uh, Adam. He had picked up, uh, apparently Adam was, I, I think the story was that he was an itinerant that came and just stayed for years and years and years and helped them out a lot because they had no children. And um, Alfie, and you see in the background all that corn, uh, he was a great farmer. He had a lot of corn and vegetables and things. And Adam, on the right, uh, one time we were visiting Aunt uh, Virgie and Uncle Al and my sister and I were real little. We were outside holding hands and Adam come up to us. There's nobody around. He says, hey little girls. He says, did you ever see a chicken die? And we just opened our eyes and said, no. He says, come over here once. So he walked over there. He picked up a chicken, took it over to a block of wood and chopped off its head. And it went running around with the blood squirting all over. We were two little girls from the city and we were just we were frozen. We were frozen. We were so scared. <laughs> and he laughed. He thought it was funny. <laughs> now we're recording. Is that from your family? Yeah. Who are we looking at here? On the left is Alberta Metaxon, and to her right, I don't know if she was married to him yet or not. They're teenagers. Uh, now they're older than I am. <laughs> and... Uh, Gerald Metaxon, that's my mother's first cousin, and then Mercy and Eli, and I can't recall their last names. And Mercy would be my, my uh, grandmother's sister.